Hi everyone, it's Jean Hansen, co-founder of the janitorial store and myhousecleaningbiz.com. And today I have invited a guest, Patty D. Dominic of D. Dominic and Associates. She is a uh, she's a wonderful business coach. She's also the former owner of a company that is it, she's a recruiting expert, so it's a recruiting and HR company. Correct, Patty? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh -huh. We did uh, staffing for major hospitals and universities and offices, and I had a great time for decades, as a matter of fact. Yeah, and so now she teaches other business owners how to um, grow and scale their business. And so the reason I asked Patty to join me today is because I want to talk about a problem that I'm seeing a lot of in our industry, and I, I have, quite frankly, I'm not seeing a whole lot of people talking about it. And as you all know, there's a large you know, immigrant, immigrant population in our country, which is in, um, affecting our workforce. And the problem that I see happening is that because a lot of them may not be able to speak English or speak very little English, the business owners in this country who are Native Americans and English is their primary language, they're having a hard time understanding how they should be hiring these people if they don't speak the language. So I want to talk about the language barrier that we have in our workforce and what we can do to get over that. I think a lot of people in our industry, I think there's just a lot of fear with it because it's like, what do I do? How do I interview them? How do I do an orientation? How do I train them? How do I make them understand? I mean, it's, it's hard enough training English speaking people, right? Um, so, you know, how do we go about, <laughs> yeah, I mean, training and, and hiring and retaining employees is so difficult. So I'd like to just address a few of those issues. Well, great, Jean. Yeah, I look forward to talking with you about this. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the contracts my company had was staffing many different offices for LA County Department of Public Social Services. And we were fingerprinting recipients for aid for dependent families, you know, welfare. And um, we had to train our staff on cultural sensitivity. And uh, literally there were over 25 languages that we might have to recruit for. So generally you can find someone who speaks both languages to assist you. And I really recommend that you write out some of your recruitment questions in both languages. So you have it English and whatever other language that you want. That's a, that's a great place to start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's how we started when we first, uh, our first company was in Boise and we had a quite a significant population of um, Spanish speaking immigrants and so mm -hmm. you know we started having them apply and we we also had a small population i can't remember the country but it was eastern europe and i mean honestly they were some of the best workers that we had and it it definitely was an issue because you know we would struggle with the language and then we finally found somebody that was um, bilingual and he served pretty much as our interpreter for those who didn't speak English well and he eventually became a supervisor for us and so we um, we promoted him into a supervisory position now we wouldn't have done that had he not also been a good worker he was a good leader I mean that's a big requirement you don't just put somebody into that position just because they clean well but they do have to be a leader and they have to want to do that so I guess, you know, is that pretty much the way to start with this, Patty, is to try and find that bilingual person and, and maybe, you know, offer them more money because that is going to be an additional role that they're going to play. Yes, I think it helps. Uh, of course, today we have Google Translate and some of the other apps that help us. However, uh, they're, they're not perfect. You know, we've all kind of used them and seen how certain things can get uh, messed up in the translation. So it does really help to have a native speaker of the language that you're dealing with for some of your candidates. Um, you can find translation services. If you have a little bit of money and you want to have it done professionally, uh, you can find some translation services to do your basic checklist, some of the job duties and such. Uh, but in time, I'm sure you'll be able to hire some people who have uh, caring, uh, skills and there are that are multilingual 
and you can groom and develop them to be supervisors and support for the business owner. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the, you know, just ask around. I mean, if you're in social media, you can ask around and say, do you know anyone who, um, or any companies that you've used to do the translation? Cause I have done that myself. We had some, um, some of our training materials trans, um, translated into Spanish. And I mean, now there's a big range in pricing for that. You might, you know, you can pay top dollar for that or you can, you know, don't get, don't go too cheap. Don't just go down the street to somebody that says they can translate, but do it with a professional company, but you can get it done pretty reasonably. I think that's a good idea to have some of your main documents written in Spanish. Um, for us, we also have a PEO company that does our payroll and our ma employee manual and everything HR related. So if you're a company that has that, ask them about that service. You know, can they make your manual in Spanish or whatever language that you're trying to um, have converted? Right. You know, this opens up actually the broader question because you're talking about the HR manual. And I think it's really important, especially in today's climate where recruiting is quite a challenge to be open to diversity and different cultures, um, you could double or triple your potential candidate pool with one or two strategic hires of multilingual supervisors yeah. and then folks who speak uh, the language. You can also give some basic training in English to the um, non-English speaking folks and so they can learn certain phrases, which I think would be very, very helpful. And um, well, they did that with flight attendants over the years. And um, I think that's, that's an important thing. I know in the international culture, when people are traveling, you don't have to learn to speak the language fluently, but you should be able to ask a few basic questions. And so the employer can provide those English speaking classes. It gives the employees confidence and it shows them respect that you're trying to help them uh, so that they can do better in our community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know they call them um, ESL classes, English as a second language, so that would be something to look into. Um, when I was doing a little research on this topic, I came across what was called MangoLanguages.com. <laughs> it's an app. I mean, it, it's probably similar. You know, you might have some similar situations like with Google Translate where it might not be perfect. But if you're trying to learn a little bit of the language, it sounds like this is a really good app. I haven't had enough time to really dig into it, but I would check out MangoLanguages.com um, yeah. to see how that works, too. And uh, you can also check with your high school if there's a foreign exchange student in your high school or uh, in, all across the country, there's this education first. It's an international school. So uh, they, they are bringing in students from all over the world that are essentially high school, just high school graduates. So around 19, 20, 22 years old that are learning English. And they usually have a fair amount of academic English, and then they speak whatever language is from their own country. Yeah. So I think that the language is important and also being respectful of culture because, um, you know, we Americans, we kind of joke a lot, and sometimes our, our humor can be kind of sarcastic. And we know that uh, those jokes don't often translate into another language or another culture. And we have to be very mindful so that people don't think we're laughing at them. Exactly. Yeah. There's so many differences in culture. I, I talk a little bit about that in my supervisor training video series um, for supervisors so that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that um, culturally related that if you don't know, you could really be offending some people. So um, yeah, that's something to be aware of. And, you know, one of the things that I, we did an article on this topic, and one of the things that I also mention in this when it comes to the cleaning industry is, and, and really any industry, but I mean, if you can make it as visual as possible, um, you know, one of the things that we do in our industry, and we really do it for environmentally conscious reasons, and to avoid cross-contamination, for example, we use color-coded microfiber cloths. And so each cloth is only used for a certain task. 
Mm -hmm. But you know, the visual cue can be used in this language barrier as well. Because if they know that green is only being used for dusting and red is being used for toilets and blue for mirrors, you know, that's a visual cue to them. Steve used to also, you know, with the floor work that we did, um, we would have mop buckets in different colors. So mm -hmm. if you were stripping and waxing a floor, the stripper would go in the red bucket and the rinse would go in the green bucket or whatever it was, but we'd have three different color buckets. And the mop handles all had the, um, I can't remember if they were, they had tape around them with the color or they were color coded or colored handles, I believe. So, you know, making it visual, the safety, the labels that are on products, they've got those um, safety, um, now I can't think of the word for it, but they've um, got these different icons on there so that they know if they're hazardous. Symbols, right. Mm -hmm. yes. So a lot of the visual cues can be helpful as well. Um, but I, I just wanted to come back to what you said earlier about, I think this is a really big missed opportunity if people aren't taking advantage of this labor pool. Um, you know, it, like you said, it's growing continuously. The latest statistic I saw was it was our immigrant workforce was um, about at 17% now, and it's growing all the time. And so if you're not taking advantage of that and figuring out a way to do it successfully in your business, I think you're just really missing some really good workers out there. I mean, I constantly, I still hear people complaining, oh, people, you know, hired somebody and they didn't show up for their first day or they worked for a week and they didn't show up, you know. So some of these people are very hard workers and they'll show up. Yeah. Well, the data is that there's a fairly high percentage of people who actually don't show up for their second day of work. Once a job, you know, the job offer has been accepted, the likelihood that they're going to show up, you'd think it would be 95% people show up for their second day or second day of week, but it's significantly less than that. I haven't done any research on that in the last 10 years, but it used to be something like uh, in the employment business when somebody said, oh, we hired someone and they're starting next Tuesday. I said, okay, well, we'll call you on Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> so we check in with them. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because I think uh, recruiting is one of the things that uh, people have told us that they're having challenges with. And so uh, think in terms of where uh, the folks from different cultures and different ethnicities might be hanging out. So you can go to the Brazilian restaurant, yeah. you could go to the, um, the church, uh, I remember we had difficulty when we were looking for people to who spoke Armenian. So we went to the Armenian church, the big Armenian church in LA. They knew all the Armenian immigrants because it was very well networked. So that was where we recruited because we needed to have for the Glendale, California uh, welfare office, we needed to have uh, Armenian speaking support team members there. Um, the other thing to remember, you mentioned color coding. It's, I think that's good, and I think the visuals are excellent also because most of us can read sign language, but some people are colorblind. And then, of course, we have to remember American Sign Language. And uh, I was just uh, studying a little bit about that. There have been some issues with deaf uh, folks because when they are stopped by police officers, they tend to, you know, if they get excited, they're speaking with their hands, and the police officers have sometimes considered this as being aggressive. So if you're dealing with someone who's deaf and they're kind of excited, they're going to be, you know, waving their hands. It doesn't, in, in that culture, for those individuals, it doesn't mean that they're attacking you. It just means they're kind of excited and trying to communicate more urgently to you with their with their sign language. So all of these represent opportunities. And if you are just a little bit resourceful about going and getting helpers on the translation, you can really beat your competition by hiring great people. And the other thing I want to say is there's often a very high percentage of highly educated immigrants. And so those folks may be professionals in their own country and those, those certifications didn't transfer over readily. So you might have, you might have a doctor working for you until they get all their U.S. certifications uh, just because they want to put food on the family table. Right, exactly. So one last thing I just wanted to um, mention, Patty, before we sign off. Um, you know, I, I see some people saying, well, 
I won't hire anybody that doesn't speak English. And I think they need to be careful with that legally. I mean, you don't want to be discriminating against people. And I know that there's, um, I was doing a little research there too, and SHRM, who's the um, HR association, um, you know, some people require that they speak only English at work. And there's a law that, or um, it, it, basically it says that employers can require employees to speak only English at work if they can show that doing so is a business necessity, such as for safety reasons. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, the company who is diverse and resourceful in recruiting people from many countries and people who speak many languages will have a little bit more effort to accommodate those people. But I think they're going to clean up over the competition who is more restrictive. And um, I would rather have a diverse workforce who had many different perspectives and who really, really wants to be there uh, than a group of English speaking Americans who might have an attitude problem. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, you don't want to cut out a third of your workforce just because of that. And I get if there are safety issues or other things, but I would give those folks a chance because sometimes you can break a recruiting barrier and now all of a sudden you have a steady pipeline of otherwise highly qualified candidates to choose from and you can get some fabulous people and, and oftentimes they're very loyal. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So great advice. All right. Well, thank you, Patty. I appreciate your coming and joining me today for this discussion. I think there's, I think that probably you will open up some eyes, you know, and the, to the possibilities that, you know, they are missing opportunities by not being open to hiring a diverse workforce. So thank you. You're so welcome. Well, I look forward to our next conversation. And uh, as always, if there's anything else I can do for you, Jean, just let me know. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Patty.